to use to actually filter through git blame back to the source just because you can really easily um, click links to parent commits and then refind your location rather than having to <clears throat> uh, check out older versions. <clears throat> Not sure what's up with my voice today, but hopefully I'll stand up until the talking. Uh, okay. Where did we? Where were we, anyways? We were in uh, lib. Let me increase the size a bit here so you can all see. Lib internal uh, process next tick, and we want to look at blame. Ooh, right. Okay. Um, so a while ago. Um, actually, that's already been a while, hasn't it? Wow. Um, so earlier this year, I actually made a pretty large commit um, to Node Core that actually um, changed one of the long-standing sort of odd things in how it was structured internally. Um, originally, and for the longest time up until part of this year, there was this Node.js file that was in our SRC, the source folder. Um, and that was always really weird because all the rest of our JavaScript code was in the lib folder and source, source the in the source directory, um, it was all just C++. Um, and everyone kind of seemed, everyone that was like new kind of seemed to miss the, either why this was there or that it was even there in the first place. Um, so earlier this year, I actually separated out into internal files and then moved what was remaining into um, into lib internal. There's a bootstrap underscore Node.js file. So that's where Node.js actually starts from after C++ now. Um, is this bootstrap Node.js file? Uh, it used to be src slash um, node dot js, but no longer is. So it looks like um, we're kind of at a little bit of a problem there because it was code that I moved. So we're going to need to look um, at the parent of this and actually try to find where this whoops, originally was in src slash node.js. Let's let's turn on git blame again so we can actually see what happened because of why. So somewhere down at the bottom here, we should should get to our thing. Uh, ooh, I forgot. There's a lot more in this than is in our single file. So let's actually search for it. Tick done. Or. Actually, maybe we'll just search for this entire thing. Okay. So looks like this commit by Trevor Norris about improving the performance of Next Tech quite a while ago. It looks like this might have introduced it. Um, no, it looks like it was originally still there. Okay. So we can see, um, oh, is there more than one spot? Okay, so we can see it was added here, but it was also um, removed in the same diff, so it must have been there before. So let's try looking again at that same spot in the parent of this commit. Browse files, src, node.js. Try and find the same thing. So it, it's twice here for some reason. Let's turn on git blame. Um, so this is tick domain callback. That's interesting. So if this also existed in tick domain callback, let's actually look at our coverage for a second because maybe, maybe it's twice in this file too. It is. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so it's we actually have two files here. 
And I actually, sorry, two functions. I actually missed it when I was looking here. Um, so we have one for when tick callbacks are run. And again, it said no domain up here. So I should probably should have clued in. Um, and that one appears to be hit. So uh, we are hitting, uh, let me highlight that again. So we are hitting um, this one up here in the regular tick callback, but it's the one in the domain callback that we're, we're not hitting. So that must be mean there's already a, a test that um, it hits it normally. So that should be a lot easier for us to do if we uh, find that test and either modify it or make a similar one to also test uh, this code path. Um, okay, uh, let's try and find this test then. Um, nowadays, most Node.js tests are in the test slash parallel directory, um, which is really quite large. Um, but usually they're named reasonably well. So mm, there's a couple over here that say next tick. Next tick doesn't hang. Mm, that doesn't look related. We're looking for something that makes a lot of iterations of next tick. Uh, next tick of intentional starvation. Process dot max tick depth value. I wonder if that's in our other file anywhere. No, no, no. Did I say that wrong? No, I'm not seeing that. I wonder how process dot max tick depth gets set though. Because maybe it it's set by the same thing. So that might be our test. Um, let's try and find that correctly. So I suspect that's not actually set by JavaScript, but that's probably set by C++. Um, that's just sort of an intuition thing I have from working on this a little bit. I think it's probably set over node.cc because that's where a lot of these things happen. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, hmm. Let's globally search that in lib. See if it shows up. No. And source. Does that even exist? I feel like this process dot max next max tick depth that this test is referring to doesn't even exist anymore. Or maybe we're like setting it. Hmm. Interesting. So this makes a bunch of next text, but I'm not sure if it's enough. And it doesn't really seem to be interacting with them. Okay, so we're look we want one that interacts with domains though, but we're looking one for one that doesn't. So let's look at some other next tick tests just to see if there's something that looks a little bit um a little bit more like what we're looking for. This only seems to make about six or seven next ticks in total. So that's probably not what we want. I think. Unless that was actually, maybe I'm looking at this wrong. So it calls tick done if tick info candex is less than IE4. So it actually calls that if it's less than. Okay. And this one. Hmm. I wonder why. So it mustn't do what I originally thought then. So it looks like it actually only calls tick done if it's less than the, the index. Maybe I have that wrong. Sorry, if. If 1e4 is less than no, it is it is what I thought. So okay, so it does it does try to to stop it if if it's gone too many iterations. Um, so maybe that's the test we want. Ordering, I'm not too concerned about ordering in this case, so I doubt that's it. Errors. 
Mm, doesn't look like it makes enough. It's not really looping anywhere. 1e4 next x is quite a lot. Whoops, same file. Let's look on domain. Mm, nothing of note. Doesn't hang. Right, that was that one. Uh, so it looks like this must be this intentional starvation one. Um, this would probably be a little bit easier if I actually had the coverage running locally, but I don't have the coverage running locally. Um, need to set that up soon. I might We might actually uh, take a look at doing that to see if this actually is what we want or not. So... This looks like it make it like infinitely recurses on the spin function um, until it reaches a certain amount of time, maybe. Timer ran once the ban was lifted. So timeout, so it makes this on timeout, and if it's not starved, it says the timer escaped. Right, so it looks like this tries to starve it up to 100,000. It's funny that it's not, it doesn't really seem to be testing that specifically though, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is the domain one, right? Yeah. Let's look at back where we where we were for a second. Um, looking back through git blame even more, I think this is where we were at. Tick domain callback looks right. So node clear. Oh, perfect. Um, some node clear next queue when using domains. When the domain specific code was reintroduced in commit, the conditional to check and clear the next queue if many items had run was not introduced. This allows for the application to run on memory if domains are being used in for infinite recursive loop. Okay, um, so I suspect that that sounds an awful lot like this one test. Maybe if we actually look at the other code point code location of it, we might be able to find it with the actual test. Hmm. That doesn't look like the same test. Okay. So this is where this was originally um, implemented. And there was this test next tick infinite calls, but it's actually in the pummel directory. So I think we usually don't run pummel tests because they're usually very intensive, but maybe we actually do nowadays. So we'll have to take a look at those. Pummel tests. Okay, so let's look over here. So while most tests are normally in parallel, um, in our parallel directory, uh, there's some that aren't. So let's take a look in our pummel directory if this is here still tasks next what was it called text next infinite calls looks like it's still here um i think the next thing to check is if these are actually run in the ci or if they're run in general when we run general tests so we'll need to look in our make file for that look for test um, hmm. Yeah, so I didn't think they were. So this is our test runner invocation here. It runs tests are in add-ons, doc tool, inspector, no one issues, message, sewer TDY, parallel, and sequential directories. But it doesn't test the pummel directory. So uh, it's a little bit strange that one code path is actually being hit unless uh, this code coverage um, is actually testing the pummel tests too, which it might be. So let's take a look at that for a second. Um, so the code for our coverage is currently in the testing working group. Um, 
And yeah, I think it kind of gets like injected um, in when we run it. Um, let's take a look. I think somewhere in here. Hmm. One second. I think I actually had a message about this in IRC earlier, so maybe maybe that would be a better way to look. There we go. Oh, it was in the applied diff. Okay. Um, it's a normal job. This is currently make run CI. So let's see what run CI does. I didn't think it checked pummel tests, but maybe it does. That just runs test CI. Dash CI. Okay. Test CI args. Parallel args. Wow, a lot of stuff in here. Um. CI JS test suites is probably what we're looking for, I think. We want um, JS tests. Yeah, so that just runs the same stuff almost as what gets run locally. So that doesn't test pummel tests either. So it's really strange that uh, that one of our paths here actually gets taken. Wonder what test does that. Really sure. Maybe, uh, maybe we can like put some logging in there and then run all of our tests and see what see what comes up. Make it like error out or something. Find find which which test is the culprit of calling this code path. Plus s dot. the culprit and let's just exit immediately with code of one so that our test runner actually sees it as a fail I don't think this should explode but it might take a second to build Oh, by the way, if anyone has any questions uh, Node.js Node related, um, feel free to ask those in the chat and I'll, I'll try to answer them. Okay. Of course, this is like a lot of work, so my computer's fans are all spinning up like crazy, but it'll be fine. Uh, looks like we're about 500 tusks, so that's pretty good. Looks like not everything's exploding, that's for sure. So it's probably just one tusk somewhere that's triggering it. Either that or coverage is wrong for some Oh wrong for some reason. This test is the culprit. Okay, so next to intentional starvation. Looks like it was the test that we originally thought. Um, that's good. Uh, that means we don't need to rely on pummel tests for this. Uh, we can probably just adjust this somehow to, um, to also run in domains.
looks like that was the only test. Okay. Um, so maybe we can uh, make like a copy of this test then. Uh, let's undo our little patch here first. Make sure we aren't doing that anymore. Uh, so we didn't see this process.max tick depth thing anyway, anywhere. So let's actually unset that. Because maybe this test like that we just found isn't even working properly anymore. Uh, so we're going to build node and we're actually going to invoke the test runner directly so that we can only uh, run a subsection of the tests. We don't need to wait for all of them. So tools, test.py, mode equals release. We want to do parallel slash test next tick star. I think that should hit it. Yeah, it does. Um, interesting. Pretty sure I'm running this test. Yeah, we're definitely running it. Um, so this test seems to have relied on this old max tick depth variable, but it looks like it's actually hitting that new code path now. So we can probably actually refactor this to get rid of this date stuff because I suspect that's not even being hit. Um, maybe we'll actually see that if we run it directly. So do node test slash parallel oops slash text next text intentional starvation uh, it does look like it hits that okay I wonder why that max tick depth thing was set then Hmm. Interesting. Um, I can't say I was expecting to have um, run quite into this far down the pipe to uh, what we were looking for, but... Yeah, actually just refresh something. I think some of my chat on screen was a little bit stuck for some reason. It's supposed to fade out after a while. Okay, so um hmm. Let's let's actually look for where this test was originally um introduced then because it looks like it's maybe not quite working the way it was supposed to be. Uh that's a little bit of a rabbit hole, but um probably worth it for what we're looking for. So what was that called? Next tick starvation. Um whoops. We want to be in test parallel. Hopefully it shows enough items um to find it. Next tick in yeah, okay. So let's try and figure out where this was added. History. Okay. So a long time ago now, um, back when we were moving to IOJS, we actually split a lot of the tests out of um, an old test directory into a parallel and sequential directories. Uh, so that we can run as many tests as possible in parallel. Um, but it looks like we're running into that commit right now. So we need to go back pretty far. Whoops. Want the test directory. So back then, everything was just in a simple directory. 
simpler times. Looks like there's only one commit. So yeah, I couldn't find this max tick depth at that time, but it looks like back then was when this test was added. So I wonder if back then, if not saying max tick, tick depth like made it not work. Um, or if that was like one e, is this maybe this is like essentially the same thing we're we're checking now, um, when we're checking one e four. I'm not really sure. I don't really want to try and find where these APIs were, where that uh, property was removed. Trying to find where it was removed is usually a lot more difficult. Um. Introduce this test. Okay. Um, hmm. So what does it actually do here? So it says start new date. I wonder if we don't use the new date, but if we use a property, we should be able to detect if we're actually in. Hmm. In the next tick or not. Or rather, if if we've done moved into IO because we've overflowed it and we've set um, we've said that, uh, or we've rather called that uh, the tick is done. Um, hmm. So maybe we can have a, um, a simpler test than this. When I originally looked at it, I thought it should be pretty easy to just make a lot of next ticks and then um, check in an immediate if all of them had been ran or not. Um, so maybe that would be useful in addition to this. It's a little bit awkward though, since both of those kind of take different code paths. Domains, domains are a little bit interesting in the code base, that's for sure end up in situations like this with different code paths and weirdness. Um, let's just try making a copy of this test. Uh, I think I need to actually find the file for that. Make a duplicate easy. There we go. Let's duplicate this file. Um, next tick, domain, what was the other commit that we found called? Was it this one? No. There was one later than this. Okay, maybe we've lost it in our browser history. Uh, what should we call this? Test next tick. Um, something domain. Text, test next tick. No infinite. Oh, something like that. Um, domain, no infinite loop. I don't know, we can always make this test name shorter later. Let's do the same thing, except let's go to next domain. Um, hmm. It's strange that that actually doesn't do anything particular. 
but maybe just requiring domain will will run into this. I'm not really too sure. Let's find out. I forgot how domains interact with lots of these things. Uh, so. Code path hit. Let's try running uh, build node again. And then we're going to try running our test again and see, see if we hit that code path or not. Uh, actually, we want to run our, our new test. We can run our old test too, but I don't think that will hit it. So, um, we called it infinite. No, what do we call it now? Domain infinite. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like it's ho oh wow, it's actually hitting the code path like a lot. It's interesting. Okay. Um, so it looks like just requiring that is like enough to do it. So maybe we can actually consolidate this into one test then if it's, if we're hitting it that much. Um, maybe that's not a good idea because domain kind of like touches everything a little bit, can change behavior when you don't really expect it and sometimes in tests and stuff. Uh, we don't really want to be doing the same thing though. So uh, let's just try and, and hit this code path the way, oops, I actually probably want this back in there for now. The way I originally thought, um, and that's gonna be to make um, a lot of set timeouts, um, just enough actually, um, that one of them, uh, that won't fire, um, and then we can check if set immediate. I think I think that should work. If set immediate um, fires before the next next tick does. So we can probably um, change up all of this a little bit. We don't need most of this here, um, but we. Uh, I think we probably want to do this for recursive. It's going to be the easiest. So let iterations. Or we can just say let i equals zero. We don't need to be that fancy. Um, and then we can. Probably add that, I think like that, um, each time. Get rid of some of these things because we probably don't need them. Um, yeah, we're not going to be checking the timer there. We are going to be running spin. And we're going to have a set immediate. I think this should work. Um, because process.nextTick, if you call it recursively, it actually um, runs sort of like synchronous code. It doesn't, it blocks IO. Um, set immediate doesn't, so set immediate uh, should only happen after we've touched the actual event loop again. Uh, so this, even if we're calling it recursively, it should always stay effectively synchronous until, until we um, hit that little conditional and then it should uh, bail over into the next tick, I think. Literally the next tick. Um, by the way, like process.nextTick, it used to work the way it says, but it doesn't anymore, and it's like the worst named API ever. Um, it actually runs in this tick. Before next tick would be maybe a better name. I don't know. Uh, so we probably don't need most of this stuff anymore. Um, we want to have a conditional if I is greater than 1e4, then we want to do something else. Um, otherwise, we just want to make more next ticks. I think that should uh, hit it. Or at very least, it should up the iteration count, even if there's not that many next ticks um, 
at any one point in time. Uh, do we need these? I'm not sure if we actually need those variables anymore. Um, so for over 1e4, we actually want to probably set something here. Um, want to set, so let's um, loop size exceeded equals false. And then we can uh, set this in there if we've actually looped when we don't want to have looped. So we can check this again. Whoops, we can set this in here. And then that's what we're gonna check in our set immediate. And I think assert strict equal, so the exceeded false. Uh, I think we're requiring a cert, yeah. It's a new test, we can change that to use ES6 const and stuff, all goodies. Um, and then, if greater than i4, we can do that, else, oh, I guess we just return there, so we don't really need an else statement, okay. Um, then we actually don't need all this process the exit stuff because we can make sure that our set immediate callback was called. Um, so we have a bunch of common test helpers um, in a in test slash common JS. Um, if you're building node te like node core tests ever, um, very useful. So we can call call common dust dot must call the function, um, and that will ensure that this function or arrow function um, does actually get called by the time of exit. And I think it'll also check if it's only called once. Or maybe you need to specify that. I'm not sure. I think it. I, I think it checks if it's if you only need to if blah, if it's only been called once. Um. Four. Uh, so I think this should work unless I'm not seeing something correctly. Um, we only want to see the loop size exceeded if it's that, and then if our iteration size is greater than 1e4, then we should have already bailed into the next tick. Um, We might want to actually check that this actually does get set. No, I think we're probably good with this. Let's let's give this a try and let's see if it hits. Common is not defined. Whoops. Uh, const common equals. Whoop, not spelling that right. Okay. True equals false. Maybe I'm off by one. Let's set this after the conditional. No. I am requiring domain. Oh, I did hit the code path there, um, but it looks like set immediate doesn't catch that. It's interesting. So maybe it actually doesn't bail out unless it needs to for some reason. Let's take a look at our code again. Look at this tick done thing. Um, so it does set the tick info, it does set our index in the queue to zero. Um, maybe this is like, Maybe this doesn't actually exit it. It's funny that it's called ticked on then. Maybe it's like more of an optimization to reduce the list size. I don't know why that'd be the case. So if the length is not zero, which uh, it must be in this case, um, and then if the length is less than the index, sets it to sets length to zero. 
Otherwise... Let's not do next to q.splice. Zero candix tech info candix next to q length. I'm not really sure what that does. Stuff's a little bit difficult to parse in the head. It's interesting though that it doesn't actually bail out there. I wonder if it actually runs more synchronously then. Let's go back and maybe add like another debug statement to this thing. Figure out exactly how it works. Um, so maybe if we let i equals zero. And then every time this text Well, that's weird. I don't know why there's like two loops in here. I'm sure there's someone that has like a better an answer to this than I do, but. Let's check maybe the inner loop. Let's just actually print both loops. See how many iterations they get. So I plus plus here. And then J plus plus here. And if we hit this, we'll say code path hit i use a template template literal would be a little bit easier. Um, i is i and j, which is our inner, is j. rebuild node and see what we get out of this. Configure make j8. Okay, and let's run our file. One E4, just a thousand, 10,000. Okay, it looks like it's 10,000. So it looks like we only had, we only were in this outer area once, so we probably don't care about it. And then when this hit, it was 101. So maybe in here, this actually needs to be greater than 1e4 plus 1. Could that be? Is this like an off by one error thing? No. That's strange. So maybe it's, it must be like exiting here. Um, so when it exits, we'll print tick call back done. So maybe it actually still iterates synchronously more than, more than that. I'm not sure how we will test this then. Um, we'll try and figure it out. Okay, so it looks like we get, that gets hit when that overflows, and then we actually get a couple more iterations still in that loop, so we can't, what that kind of says is that everything's kind of running synchronously, and so it won't run set immediate, so I'm not really sure how we would uh, detect that this tick done thing happened. Hmm. Um, 
Let's read the original commit message for this. Removing the depth counter while processing the next queue made it possible to run out of memory if an infinite recursive loop using in an infinite recursive loop using next tick. There's also an edge case where too many callbacks were being pushed onto the next tick queue while not actually being recursive. Hmm. Okay, this is really kind of stretching like the bounds of my understanding. This seemed to check a set immediate. Oh, wait. Well, okay, so this is actually checking if it has a JavaScript allocation failed. Um, it's funny that our other test run... Well, our, this test runs into it, but like, how do we detect that we've actually hit that code path is the question. Maybe the way, only way is a pummel test to make sure that the JS allocation hasn't failed. But that's not really going to help our code coverage, so interesting. Okay, maybe this is like kind of chasing something that uh, maybe we should just have like an ignore statement in there to ignore it in uh, code coverage because I'm not really sure how we can actually tell that we've hit this code path. Because I don't think we have access to the next to queue. We don't. It's an internal array. I don't think we have access to tick info either. So I'm not really sure how we can detect that. So maybe this one, I'll have to move on to something else. Doesn't look like, uh, I don't know how we can make much progress here. Oh, maybe I'll uh, ask someone who has been a little bit more familiar with the code base um, what exactly um, we can do there. Whoops. I open up actually GitHub Desktop. Usually I use GitHub Desktop and actually manage branches where I have unstaged work on. So I think we're going to stash this. Um, I can try and work on it later. Maybe I'll come back next week and report that I've found a way to do it. But um, we'll try and uh, find some other place in the coverage that's uh, maybe a little bit more manageable to do. Um, next tick domain infinite loop test okay let's try and find something a little bit more manageable to do reorganize my windows up while we're at it um sorry about that i thought that would be a little bit easier than it was sometimes that's just the way it is though um i don't know everything about this code base either it's quite large um, but I'll just have to try and find someone, maybe Trevor, who originally did the commits, um, ask him what's up with that or how I could find out. Uh, okay. So let's reset a couple things and try and find uh, some other code coverage spot to take a look at. Hopefully we can find something that we can actually uh, make some progress with. Um, there was this other one in in NextTech that I wanted to look at. Um, so I think this let's look at this in the editor. Whoops, where is my next tick? Thing. So way down at the bottom here, we have um, one other thing. This might be a little bit easier. Um, so when you call, I'll, I think this should be pretty easy. I'm not sure. Um, so when you call next tick, um, it checks a couple things. Um, make sure it um, makes sure that your callback is actually a function. If it doesn't, it uh, throws a type error. 
Um, that's something that a lot of core APIs do. If you provide them obviously invalid parameters, they will throw error, type errors where they are. Um, and then it has this other thing. So if we're on the way out, don't bother. It won't get fired anyway. So if there's this process underscore exiting thing set, um, it doesn't even try to register these. So let's take a look at where these might exist. Um, look in lib first and try to figure out if there's a way that we can uh, test putting, um, what's it called? Um, test hitting that uh, code path. I think if we, whoops, if we cause an exit um, and then try to schedule an exit, that should be easy enough. Um, that should work, I think. Whoops, wrong file. Uh, so process underscore exiting it seems to get set in lib. Maybe it also gets set in src though, so we should take a look. No, it looks like oh, we only have a string there. Um, let's take a look back in lib. Uh, hello, new cop. How are you doing? Right, so we were, so this gets checked a couple times, gets set in two places. So looks like if you call process.exit, um, so this is in, I think this is in lib slash internal slash process.js um, is where we set um, a couple other things for the process object. And one of them is process.exit. It looks like um, if it's not already exiting, this will set processed underscore exiting and emit exit. So it's probably really easy for us to check uh, this by just calling exit. Um, there's another code path, I think, over in here that called it. But this is on uncaught exception, fatal exceptions. And that might be, we could try that too, but it might be a little bit more difficult so I think it I think we're probably good just by calling process exit and checking it so let's uh, this should be pretty pretty simple it's not doing anything particularly silly with the file system so let's make a new file in parallel since it should be able to be parallelized um, test next tick something or other um, test process test next tick um, when exiting dot js use strict and okay I'm doing all right um, I was looking at so we're looking at um, uh, node.js code coverage today uh, if you haven't already clued in from like the big thing that's under my desktop. Um, and I was looking at this other spot beforehand and didn't, wasn't able to make much progress with it. I'm not really sure if there's like a good way to detect that that code path is actually hit since it kind of just modifies internal stuff. But I'm going to try and uh, get some code coverage for this other spot. const common probably use our common helpers um, so node.js core tests require um, in the linter that you always in that you always require uh, the our common module um, our common test helper module that's because it actually does some checking for globals um, even if you require it to make sure there's no global leakage and stuff and we probably want the assert library too. So this should be pretty easy, I think. Um, it checks on process exit. 
so we should be able to check if we called or didn't call the call back. Um, so if we do process.exit and then we try to do process.next tick. Uh, this function should never be called. So we could probably just like throw an assertion failure actually if it's in that. That might be the easiest way to do that. We might actually have a common helper that um, fails if functions are called. Uh, or maybe just fail. Is that the one that there is? I think we just do uh, common.fail in this case, actually. So if this callback is ever called, we should common.fail the message of, I think that's how this works. Um, hmm, not quite, okay. Not sure why it didn't work this way. I think it should like actually return a function so that you don't need to function wrap it in this layer, but I don't think we've ever done that for some reason. So we should wrap it in a function and be say, um, process is exiting, should not be called. Maybe we should also assert that our process.exiting property was actually set. Um, Cert.strict equal. Process. Let's make some semicolons because that's what our linter likes and we should be able to give this a go and it should work I think. So let's recompile node quickly, get rid of our changes from the last thing we were trying to look at. And we'll try just running this fun this test first. So test slash node test slash parallel. Oh my gosh. Uh, Parallel slash test next tick. What do we call it? W next tick one exiting. Uh, cannot find common. Okay, I had the wrong wrong directory there. I think. Uh, so that passes. So let's try building node and have it not set this exiting variable and see if it uh, if that causes it to correctly fail. I think it should. No, it doesn't. Okay, that's interesting. Oh wait, did I not save that? Oh my gosh. Hold on. Rebuild again. Uh, still not failing. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe if we uh, comment out this bit of next tick. So maybe process.exiting is set somewhere else. that I didn't already see for some reason. So, but this should fail if we actually remove it from, remove these lines from the next tick source, hopefully. Nope. Uh, so it doesn't fail there. We are asserting, so this is, all. well, this is still set true. Okay. 
So we must be setting it somewhere else, even if the dot doesn't set it. That's that's really interesting. Um, so let's look at exiting again. It looks like we're probably not setting it. Uh, well, we could try. We could try commenting out the code from uh, the fatal exception, exception handler, but we're not throwing any exceptions right now, so I don't think that should be hitting it. No, doesn't look like that's affecting it. So maybe process exiting is actually being set by C++ somewhere. So let's look back in source. So uh, for C++, we set a lot of um, set a lot of uh, strings to like stored static strings using this macro thing. So actually searching for underscore exiting, which would probably be uh, what we were looking for, because that's be the property name we set on the process object. Um, it's actually set here to this exiting string. So to actually search for this in C++, we can look for exiting string instead. Uh, OK, so it looks like, oh, where's my highlighting? OK, so uh, this is the emit exit function. And it looks like it sets the exiting string to true. Um, it's kind of funny that we don't hit that when process.exiting is set here. But let's actually try commenting out that and the one here and see if it's uh, see if it works. Or rather, see if it fails, just to make sure we're actually testing the right thing. Hmm, interesting. Still not, still not failing. So I think I'm, so I'm asserting that process exiting is true. Maybe. Mm, exit, oh, I'm being silly. So exit actually interrupts my synchronous code. So I need to do this, this kind of thing in on exit. On exit. Uh, I think common at mass call is probably doesn't work anymore if you call it on exit callbacks. Maybe it does. We can always do another wrapping later. So maybe this will actually work. Okay, so that asserts that false is equal to true. Uh, so process underscore exiting is, was not set. Um, so we're not setting that anymore. So that allows that to fail. And I think it's just going to bail out early then. So if we re-add our, our other things and rebuild. And actually, we don't want to be rebuilding quite yet, but we actually want to Let's just make sure it works the way we're expecting. Okay, so if nothing changed, it works. So if we actually comment out this thing, which is what we're trying to test, then rebuilding and running it should cause a failure. Nope. So we must be checking somewhere else um and making and not running next ticks so that's like a sort of bail early thing uh hmm that's gonna be kind of hard to hit well i think this test might actually hit that so let's just uh put a print statement here instead 
Um, underscore raw debug. Hello. Our code path hit. It's a small r. Rebuild, and I think that should hit that code path still. I think um, what's happening is somewhere down the line, it's actually, even though it's it's like uh, registering this next tick, it's not actually uh, going through the next ticks and calling them once it when, once you're in exit. It's probably the case. So yeah, the code path is hit by this test. Uh, so that's what we really want to know. Um, but if anything were to, to change, maybe if that was for some reason removed, and if the guards weren't uh, put on process next tick, um, this would would then fire. So this test is probably useful anyways. Um, so that, it looks like that uh, is kind of done. So let's, I think I've reverted all my changes to anywhere else. I think so, yes. So let's um, build and run all the tests. That's also going to run the linter for us at the end. So we can see if we've made any mistakes. It's going to take a couple couple seconds. Uh, we can probably already start f uh, making a commit message maybe. Let me, um, one second, make a new window. Okay, so we want to get add, oh, not a repository. Let's check out our node repository and get commit dash m. Um, uh, I really don't like writing commit messages into the actual command, so when I'm using the command line, I tend to amend the commit to actually bring up an editor and run it. I'm sure there's a way to probably bring up an editor when you're actually just writing the commit message for the first time, but I just don't happen to know what it is. Um, so for all um, core commits, we append them with or prepend a subsystem into the commit message. So this would be process. Um, actually, it wouldn't be process. It's just uh, we're testing process. So it's test um, ensure next tick is not scheduled in exit. I'm gonna set rulers, so that's only 46 characters, so that's good. Um, fits within our 50 character guideline. We'll, uh, make this formatting a bit better. It's not scheduled an exit. Um, I'm not sure if we can really point to a code coverage line, unfortunately. Um, so maybe we'll just point to a specific line. In the code. Maybe that's not a good idea, actually. Um, previously, so let's make a little comment about code coverage instead. Previously, um, our tests did not check this code path as seen at coverage.nojs.org. Um, that's within the, I think there's an, I think our limit's 80 characters or is it 72? I think it might be 72. So let's uh, actually just wrap this over there. Um, I don't think there's much else to say about this. So we should be able to just uh, commit this and then make a small pull request. 
Uh, looks like there was no arrows found, and our lint. Uh, where's my cursor? Our lint ran just fine. Uh, so let's make this into a pull request. Uh, let's make a separate branch for this first. Get checkout dash b. Next tech coverage. Tech tech coverage. Nope, that's not what I want. I want next tech coverage. Um, sure, that'll be fine. Push. We can push this to my origin, and then we can make a pull request for it. So let's go to. Our node repo. Uh, so we just pushed a branch to our local, or sorry, our remote, but uh, make a pull request to the master branch. Uh, we're all, so all, all uh, Node.js core development, um, pretty much, um, if it can be, is done on the master branch, or rather, like, every all the new commits that land. So that's where we're going to make our pull request to. Um, a little checklist here to fill out. Uh, so make uh, make J test did work. Um, there's definitely a test included. Um, we didn't change any documentation, so we can get rid of that one. And our commit message does follow the commit guidelines. Uh, this is tests and well, technically just test subsystem, but we can also put process there. Um, so it picked up our. Oops, I made a little typo there. Oops. Okay, so I'll fix that in the commit message in a minute. So it grabbed our commit message since we just had one commit, and we can also make a, a little comment that actually points to the code coverage spot. So C, not scroll down to the bottom. To the bottom. Um, and we use a, a bunch of labels for sorting by subsystem stuff. Um, usually, uh, one of the collaborators on the project would do this um, after you submit a pull request. Uh, but since I I am a collaborator on the project, I can add them myself. So uh, this should be test and process. Uh, I think that should be good. We just need to update that commit. So we'll create our pull request, and then we'll just uh, amend our commit here. Get commit amend. Us, I need an S. There we go. Get push uh, origin head force. So we'll update that, and it should be should be reflected over here in a second. Looks like it is. Yep. Um, and then we're going to do one more thing. So usually, whoops, ci.nojs.org ci should be it. So usually a collaborator would also do that because most people don't, well, people who aren't collaborators don't have access to the Node.js CI. Which, wow, well, I guess Jenkins really got updated. I'm not used to this. Um, but I'm going to schedule off a test run for our pull request. So we use a test um, project, uh, the Jenkins job handily, cal handily called node test pull request. So we're going to build that. And actually, we'll just grab everything if we just provide it with the pull request ID. Certify that reviewed it is safe, and we're gonna have our bot post the status to the pull request. Um, so that's running off, and we should see some status updates here soon from it. But that's probably about uh, it for this pull request. Um, and I realized that I made a bit of a mistake, so let's 
check out our master again while that's happening and we'll actually have to get log I'll actually have to reset it because I accidentally made this commit on my local master before reset head reset to the last known commit before that uh, yeah that looks good so yeah we can see um, our linter has popped up on here but we should see a bunch of other test runners slowly pop up on our all of our different test platforms um, so that's that's running away nicely uh, so that wasn't too hard um, hopefully this gives you a little bit I've gave you a little bit of information on how Node.js tests are made. Uh, I might try to take a look at one more since I have some time still. Um, but yeah, this is like a really great place actually. Um, if you kind of look through coverage.nodejs.org to find things that you might be able to contribute to little tests here and there. Um, you might run into some stuff like I previously did that's really complicated, um, or you might run into something that's a little bit less complicated. Um, also, uh, well, I'm at it because we actually have this now. And I'll copy the link in chat too. We actually have a guide for writing Node.js core tests. So if you if you are um, looking to contribute to the project, you've found something that maybe you think you can fix on the coverage reports. Um, we have a, a handy test, sorry, a handy guide for uh, showing you how we we write tests. Um, hopefully that helps someone. Uh, what else? Where else can we look? Hmm. Let's look. Uh, let's look in root slash internal. Read line doesn't look like it's in a good state here. Oh, right. So there's a lot of cases for our read line parser that it actually doesn't. Um, we actually don't have tests for those specific cases. So that's probably something that either myself or someone else, or if anyone's interested in doing it, that'd be something to do for sure. Uh, maybe we should look if there's something that's a little bit smaller in the time I have left. Um, actually, I think I saw something in with the warnings. Maybe that was internal process? Warning, yeah. So there's a couple um, actual process like warnings that you can listen to and stuff were added in Node.js version six. Um, so that's um, sort of a new thing. Uh, so any any like deprecation warning or anything that's made, uh, you can actually listen to that by adding like um, uh, an event handler for it. Uh, but there's a bunch of code paths in here that aren't really um really caught yet so maybe we'll take a look at uh doing one or two of those and yeah so let's take a look at those um did i close something too much here no i don't think so okay so process warning let's uh clear out what we were looking for earlier I think there's must be some tests already for this, so they're probably in parallel again. Um, test slash parallel, and we're gonna look for test dash warning. No, test dash process probably. Test dash process. Whoops, I've gone too far. Process warning. Emit warning. Emit warning looks like a good place to start. There's a couple lines in here that aren't that aren't checked. Process emit warning. Um, so one of these things, uh, let's actually just open up process that warning here. It'll be a little bit easier to see. One of the one of the things that wasn't checked. Um, so. This takes usually three parameters, but you can pass it only one or only two. Oh my gosh. Hold on a second, I'm gonna mute my microphone for that.
Sorry about that. Should probably like not have the phone plugged in here when I'm doing this. <laughs> um, right. So uh, this emit warning function can take three parameters, or it can take only one or just two. So when only one is provided, it only takes the warning parameter. And if you provide it two, I think it then. Actually, I guess you could provide it to CTORs constructors. CTOR here refers to like a constructor name, um, or sorry, the constructor function itself. I think, yeah. So you can pass um, just two arguments. So then name would be your constructor. And if it sees that, um, it should be setting the um, constructor to that and then just giving itself a name of warning. So um, let's try and add that. That should be pretty easy. So this tries emit warning, custom warning. Um, Uh, maybe this actually takes more. Oh, okay. So this can take a couple different parameters. Either you can pass it the string with that, or you can actually pass it like an error object. So let's say um, process dot emit warning. Uh, I think if I say a warning here, and then if I pass custom warning, I think I don't need to actually call that. I think I just need to pass the function that's the constructor. Then it should probably check that code path. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that it doesn't check. Maybe it doesn't. Let's go back to this. Hmm, where's it actually use constructor here? Because it doesn't seem to be actually, the test doesn't seem to be checking if we're actually using the constructor, because we only check it if we emit it with an actual error object. So we should probably also try this. So I think maybe we, we weren't catching this, this part either. Uh, that says CTOR or process emit warning. I wonder why I wonder why it would pass process dot emit warning otherwise. Let's actually look at the docs for this quickly. So nodejs dot dot org. Uh, so any for anyone that's uh, maybe recently joined, um, taking a look at improving nodejs code coverage, uh, you can see that on coverage dot dot org. Uh, working on some some of the internals, trying to get. Uh, code paths that weren't pre previously covered on them to be uh, covered. So let's look at uh, the process docs. Process, I think warning should be up here, event warning. So we want to be looking at emitting custom warnings. Process dot emit warning. So warning can be a string or an error, the warning to emit. Name can be a string. It's the name to use for the warning. CTOR function, when warning is a string, CTOR is an optional function used to limit the generated stack trace. To limit the generated stack trace. I wonder if there's like an example of that. I'm not really sure what that means. Um, let's look for emit warning. Try and find some place that's actually calling it like that. No? 
Nope, doesn't look like there is. Okay, so we might need to figure out what that exactly does. I should probably just look up what the second argument to emit stack trace does. So let's look on Mozilla Developer Network. Usually that's the source that I use to figure out what JavaScript APIs actually do. Uh, capture stack trace, I think is the API we're looking for. Is it not? Error.capture stack trace? 